Good evening and thank you for joining us. My name is Chrissy and I would like to welcome you to the Doylestown Bookshop's virtual event series. I am very happy to introduce Maya Schonbog Lang as she discusses her new memoir, What We Carry. I will be in conversation with Maya for about 30 minutes, then we'll open it up to Q&A with the audience. If you would like to submit a question, please click on Ask a Question at the bottom of your screen and enter your question there. If you're watching from a phone or tablet, click the icon with the question mark to submit your questions. If you would like to purchase her book from the Doyle's Home Bookshop, Click the button on your screen that says buy the book. We have curbside pickup available at both of our locations, or we can ship the book to you. Maya was nice enough to send us signed book plates and limited edition bookmarks. We'll be sending them out with the orders that come in from tonight's event while supplies last. I've had a few questions during past events from viewers who are accustomed to Zoom, so to avoid any confusion, only Maya and I will be able to participate through video and audio. You may, however, interact with us through the chat box on your screen and through the Q&A. Now a little bit about our guest. Maya is the author of What We Carry, named a New York Times editor's pick and a must-read Best of 2020 by Parade Magazine, Bustle, The Times of India, Pop Sugar, Bookshop.org, and others. She is the author of The 16th of June, long listed for the Center for Fiction First Novel Prize, finalist for the Audi Awards, and named a must read novel by CBS and In Style. Lang's work has been featured in the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, the Washington Post, the Times of India, and the Philadelphia Inquirer, amongst others. Lang is the daughter of South Asian immigrants and lives outside of New York City with her daughter. Hi, Maya. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. The pleasure of this is mine. And thank you to everyone for joining us, especially because it's a stunningly gorgeous day outside. <laughs> so it's lovely to have you here. So we're looking forward to hearing about your new book, What We Carry, which I have right here. I'm going to hear you read from it a little bit and talk about it a little bit before we go into our questions. Yeah, and one thing I should say, by the way, um, I welcome all kinds of questions. No question is off limits, and I love hearing from the audience. So please don't hesitate to type your questions in. And before I read, I'm just going to read a tiny little bit. Um, I should say that I never, ever thought I would write a memoir. I never set out to write a memoir on purpose. And basically, I was in the middle of working on my second novel when my mother, who was suffering from Alzheimer's, suddenly needed emergency care. And I was with her at a doctor's appointment, and they said, we can't, you know, leave her to her own care. So the sort of immediate choice was to hospitalize her. That's what they were going to do. And I just sort of blurted out in the moment, I'll take her home with me. It was not something we had ever discussed. So overnight, my life changed quite dramatically. My daughter was really young at the time. And so suddenly, I was taking care of a dementia patient and a young child. Um, and to cope with the sudden change in lifestyle and daily life, I started writing Facebook posts that were quite candid and vulnerable. And an editor saw the posts and reached out and said, would you be interested in writing a memoir? I said, no, thank you. I don't think I could do that. And that same night, I wrote something like 50 pages um, and realized that there was a lot that I needed to say that I hadn't thought about. So this first passage is actually based on one of those Facebook posts. And this takes place um, a few months into my mother's stay with me. One morning, my mother makes herself a cup of tea. I am ecstatic. After weeks of showing her how, weeks during which I'm not sure she retains a thing, weeks during which I wonder why I bother, watching her finally do it is as jubilant a moment as when my daughter took her first steps. 
the episode also drives home our reality. You made yourself tea, I crow. She, I did, she replies blankly. She doesn't remember making it, can't say how the still warm mug came to be in her hands. The accomplishment marks a ceiling in an ever shrinking space. A woman who once saved lives as a physician can now do no more than make tea. It is bittersweet, like building sandcastles on the shore. All that work speaks to its own pending erasure. The episode with the tea helps me grasp my situation. I can't fathom my mother's disease, can't wrap my mind around what it and our living arrangement mean, but a small anecdote involving tea is manageable. It gives me a story, a way to explain the ineffable. It gives me a few lines when the rest of the tale is out of reach. Alzheimer's is devastating because it annihilates one's story. It vacuums it up. Even the name feels greedy to me. What gets me is the apostrophe, that possessive little hook. It drags your loved one away from you. My mother no longer belongs to me. She belongs to her illness. My time with her, though, is a way of countering that apostrophe. The episode with the T in giving me a story allows me to stake a claim on her. The magnitude of the ocean is overwhelming, but a sandcastle, however fleetingly, defies that power. Its beauty is only more poignant for its brevity. I cannot comprehend what is coming for my mother, the tidal wave of loss. But in the meantime, we have this together, tea in the kitchen. And even if she doesn't remember it, I will. It is enough to get me through the next day and the next. Um, I wanted to share just one other thing before we get into our discussion. I will say my mother was not only a physician, she was a psychiatrist and a geriatric psychiatrist. So she was an expert in the aging brain and she actually ran clinical trials for Aricept, which is the medication that she would end up taking. Um, I always loved that she was a psychiatrist because it allowed me to imagine her as someone who was very compassionate and empathetic. And she always told me she had become a psychiatrist so that she could be around for me and my brother and that it was the most family friendly of the medical professions. So this scene takes place just a few weeks later. As my mother and I drop our pretenses, I find that I can ask her anything. I voice all the nagging questions I had as a kid. And one day it occurs to me to ask the biggest question of all. Mom, I say slowly, how did you know you wanted to be a psychiatrist? I didn't. She answers right away. I wanted to be an OBGYN. She explains that she suffered from low blood pressure, so she couldn't stand for long periods of time, which made performing C-sections impossible. With her dream job ruled out, she settled for psychiatry. That way I could sit in a chair, she says. For the next several days, I am in a state of shock. A neighbor could confess to committing murder, and all I would think about was my mom's desire to be an obstetrician. Psychiatry did not appeal to me, she admits. So many problems. Listening to people can be very boring, you know. This is the last straw, the final puzzle piece that makes me realize how much I deluded myself where my mother was concerned. The crux of her whole identity was an accident. She became a psychiatrist out of a desire to be seated. She hadn't planned for me all along and her trajectory in life wasn't a straight line. Staying in this country instead of going back to India, you know, it just happened, she says. What a surprise this would have been to hear as a girl, to know that my mother was someone to whom things happened 
that this was permissible. She wanted to give me the illusion that she had known what she was doing, and I let her. But this is not to say that our illusions were meaningless. My mother's stories may have been riddled with untruths, plagued by a suspicious lack of detail, but they defined her. They weren't necessarily true to events, but they were true to her. And as a writer, I of all people should have understood this, that a story needn't be accurate in order to be true. Now that our illusions have been stripped away, I miss my mythic mother, and I suspect she misses her too. I've been taking care of her needs. She's become physically stronger, but who is she under my care? She can take the stairs without help, go on longer walks, but she lacks her former haughtiness. Maybe it doesn't matter whether our stories are true or false. What matters is that they are ours. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to share that just to give people some sense of what the book is about. Thank you. Um, all right, so we're gonna go into the questions I have for you and we'll start with, how does being the daughter of South Asian immigrants inform what we carry? Well, it's funny, um, you know, growing up, I grew up on Long Island. I never really thought of myself as particularly Indian. I just, you know, blended in and did what I could to blend in, which is what I think most kids do. And it was only when I was my mother's caretaker that I really began processing my past in a different way. Um, my sort of immediate de facto assumption that I should take care of her, I think came from growing up, having seen multi-generational households and during trips to India, watching, um, you know, setups where children took care of their parents. And that was part of why I couldn't sort of let her be hospitalized, even though her needs at that point were quite, um, you know, intense. Uh, her, dementia, her dementia was pretty far along. So the experience of taking care of her definitely made me think about my past differently and I was also simultaneously thinking about my future through my daughter. And part of what was in my mind was that I didn't want my daughter to absorb a model that it was her duty or responsible, her um, responsibility to take care of me one day. Right. And so I was sort of grappling with that and thinking about what I grew up with and the messages that I absorbed and what messages I wanted to pass on to my daughter. And I realized that my parents always had this mentality as immigrants of scarcity and that the world is perilous and that we should, um, you know, achieve as much as possible by disrupting others around us as little as possible and that we should sacrifice ourselves for one another all of these sort of assumptions that I began to reconsider. And um, for the first time, I really started thinking about what do I want my daughter to carry in her life? And what do I want her sort of inheritance to be in terms of the stories and assumptions um, that she has in her head? I do want to remind everyone, if you'd like to ask Maya a question, please click on ask a question on your screen and submit your question there. All right. So how do secrets and what is left unsaid between parents and children affect a family? Yeah, well, so my mother was rather hilarious in hindsight <laughs> in that she always told me when I would ask her about motherhood, you know, she would have like these detailed stories about life in India and medical school and work. 
But whenever I asked her about motherhood, she became suspiciously concise and had very little to say. And especially when I became a new mother, I said, mom, how did you do this? Like, how did you manage having a career and being a mom? And she would always say, I don't know, I just did. And when I found out later in the book, there's the moment when I find out that my older brother, who's older by almost a decade, grew up in India, which I had never known. Hmm. And when I finally learned that, it was a complete shock. And I realized that she felt a, a great deal of shame and embarrassment that she had sent him to India. You know, she didn't want to reveal that to me and she felt guilty about it. But had she told me, it would have freed me up so much because I would have understood that she had help and that she didn't do it alone, which is what I'd been assuming the whole time. You know, I'd been assuming, well, she did it, so why can't I? And um, that really drove home for me that the stories that we tell our children affect their choices. And sometimes it's so tempting to edit certain things out or to just give them like the Hollywood montage <laughs> version where we smooth over and make everything look as though we are competent people at the helm. <laughs> but sometimes the things that I think we want to leave out are the most important to share. Yeah. Because when our children later in life are in very similar positions, it's almost as though they have more options and they give themselves more permission and are just in a kind of freer, more forgiving space when they know that we too struggled and wrestled with things and had to ask for help. So I think um, it's the, the parts of our stories that we are most tempted to cover up and conceal that can help others the most, particularly our children. Definitely, definitely. I have a daughter myself, she's in her early 20s, but I agree with that. Mm -hmm. I would not have guessed that you were in the early 20s. My see, who would lie about that? <laughs> <laughs> My daughter Zoe is now 12. Oh, oh, wow. Yeah. Well, here you go. Here you go. Well, you know, everyone says that, but each age has its joys and its difficulties, and they rival the uh, year that came before it, but it's all generally good stuff, I find. <laughs> It's all generally good stuff. And, yeah. you know, one of the things I talk about in the book is that, like, I think if it weren't for Zoe, I would never have become a writer. Really? Yeah. I mean, I think I always imagined that parenthood and motherhood specifically was about sacrificing yourself. It's like you become a mom and then everything kind of stops because you just focus on your children. And for me, at least when I was pregnant, I suddenly just looked at my whole life very differently. And I thought, you know, God, I've always wanted to be a writer. Why am I not trying to do that? And if I ever want to tell my daughter to pursue her dreams, she's not going to know how to do that unless I've modeled it for her. Right. Because kids, don't, you know, what they most absorb is not so much what you tell them in the preachy moments, it's your choices and what you do. So, um, yeah, when she was a newborn, it was probably like the worst time to write a novel, but oh she God. was a few weeks old. <laughs> oh. And even though my brain was fried and I was unshowered and exhausted, <laughs> I would every night, not every night, but when I could um, work for an hour or two at a late night cafe 
and that's how I wrote my first novel. Wow. wow. Um, and You're so right, though. It is the examples and and not just what we say and what we do and how we live our lives and accomplish our goals. And yes, there's sacrifice for them, but also really oh. being able to show them this is what we did. But we were also still able to be a mother at the same time. We were also able to accomplish these things. That's right. And it's not to say that, you know, it's not to minimize the work of parenting, mm -hmm. but I think there is this whole aspect that doesn't get talked about where when we step into better versions of ourselves, thinking about the fact that our children are watching us, mm -hmm. that isn't sacrifice, it's inspiration. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. even during the pandemic, you know, I think about these moments where I've held it together and tried to make the best of things for my daughter. And, you know, the traditions that we've created or the things that we've done that would never have occurred to me without her. Um, so often I think our kids bring out our best selves. Though of course there are the moments where they bring out our worst selves as well. Indeed. <laughs> oh my goodness. So speaking of being a mother, what has taking care of uh, your mother taught you about being a mother yourself? Oh, well, yeah. So basically my whole life, I told myself and everyone around me that my mother and I were really, really close and that she was this brilliant, amazing mother. And she could have done anything to me. Like she could have dropped me off in a forest for two <laughs> weeks. And I would have described it to everyone as this like confidence building experience. Um, and basically, you know, I had a really identifiably bad parent in my father who was a difficult, controlling, abusive person. And so I latched onto my mother and I needed her to be an amazing parent. And so I gave myself that. Mm. And I think children are quite amazing for how, you know, it's sort of like they're the flowers in the sidewalk that grow and find their own nutrients and they find their sun and their water. So when I was caring for my mother, I suddenly started thinking about our relationship and the fact that she hadn't necessarily been this amazing doting mother. It's that I had built up this story and this version of her because I needed it. And I found myself caring for her in ways that she hadn't cared for me. Hmm and being there for her in ways that she hadn't been there for me. And it sort of made me realize that I think caretaking and also parenting can be a kind of do-over or a form of getting it right. And sometimes we do for our children or for our parents what wasn't done for us. And, you know, uh, this is actually the quote that's on the bookmark mm. that I think at our most maternal, we aren't actually mothers. We're daughters reaching back in time and finding the mothers we wish that we'd had. Mm. So I have all these moments with my daughter where you know, I'll try, you know, I'll offer to sort of um, do something for her. And I think I'm making this like wonderful offer, but she'll have no interest in it. <laughs> and I'll realize like, oh, right. She doesn't want to go, you know, shopping for stylish clothes. That's what I wanted when I was her age. <laughs> and she's a total tomboy who has no interest in that. And she's her own person. So, you know, sometimes I think we um, process 
our own childhoods when we're in a position of caring for others. Um, and I think in that way, caretaking, that again, is something that gets perceived as sacrificial, you know, you're sacrificing yourself mm -hmm. and it's a lot of work and it's exhausting. But also for me, it was healing in certain ways in that I got to think about my own childhood very differently. And I think in caring for my mother, in some way I was caring for myself at the same time. Well, speaking of being cared to, I'm like, they're all just segueing very nicely into the next question. Can you explain the emotional labor women face as mothers and caretakers? Oh my God, the emotional labor women face especially I think during the pandemic, this has become so obvious. Um, women, I think are kind of like the first responders mm -hmm. in families or like the firefighters who right. when there's a crisis, we go rushing in. And often, you know, it's like, I was just talking with a friend of mine whose father-in-law is dealing with some health issues and her husband and his three brothers basically like didn't know what to do. And so she, even though she has like the least relationship of all of them, she's the one who has stepped in to figure things out and make sure everything gets done and to just be on top of the situation. And I think so often as women, this is what we do. We recognize that there's a need and we rush in to fill it, even when it means sacrificing ourselves or giving up parts of ourselves. And I think that, um, you know, on airplanes during the in-flight safety video, there's that whole spiel about in the case of an emergency, put your own oxygen mask on first. Mm -hmm. It's such easy advice to listen to and to nod at, but I think in actual daily life, it's incredibly hard for women especially to oxygenate ourselves and to take the time to tend to ourselves and feed ourselves and self-care, mm -hmm. I think, often in this country gets sort of treated in this ridiculous way where it gets equated with like having a brownie or mm -hmm. having a glass of wine. When really I think what women are in danger of is losing ourselves and losing our identities. Mm -hmm. And so I think during times of crisis, when it seems like the worst time to oxygenate, that's when you most need to oxygenate. And whatever that means for you, like for me as a new mother, you know, I had postpartum depression, which I talk about in the book. And what I found for me was that writing and working on my laptop for a couple of hours, that made me feel better because it allowed me to remember who I am and it allowed me to use my brain. And I felt restored and sort of returned to myself mm -hmm. as opposed to all the like silly nonsense frivolous things that they recommend that you do as a new mother like get a massage or you know whatever right. sleep Which, when the baby sleeps and you know right. <laughs> exactly so i did not sleep also my baby never slept oh. <laughs> no one was sleeping but yeah i think Women um, need to give ourselves, I was going to say people need to give women permission, but no, I actually think we need to give ourselves permission to do the things that buttress ourselves and build ourselves up. And doing that and self-prioritizing can be kind of scary mm -hmm. because it's so much easier to just be in the default mode of tending to everyone else. And it can be quite hard and go against the grain of what we've been taught mm -hmm. and the messages we've absorbed to say, actually, I need to go 
sit in my car and read for an hour. Right. Um, or, you know, whatever it is. Um, but those things can be really necessary. They are. And it's, I think sometimes it's looked at as maybe being selfish for being selfish by taking this time, but it does go back to being on that airplane. If we're not the, our best selves, how are we going to a take care of ourselves, but really take care of others and, and also beyond that accomplish what we, we want to do. We won't be able to do it if we don't take care of ourselves. That's right. And I also always think in these situations, like, yeah, when I have that fear of like, oh my God, this is selfish. I then think about my daughter and I think, well, if she was in a position where she could do something to help herself or sacrifice herself, of course I'd want her to pick herself. Mm -hmm. Of course I'd want her to center herself and not give herself up. So it's sort of like easier for me to access that place right. of permission granting if I think about it through her. Definitely. And I think it goes back to when we're talking about examples. That's another example we can set because I, I know with my mother, for example, an example, she didn't take time for herself. She didn't do any of those things. So that's the example I saw. And then that's what I did. And then it's, you know, deprogramming and reprogramming with, you know, what's the best way you can live. And it is okay. It is okay to do something for yourself. You're not, not doing what you're supposed to do. And, and you're not less of a mother or less in your career. You're just taking care of yourself so you can do a better job at all those things. That's right. We're better when we are oxygenated and to walk around in a non-oxygenated state, no one wants that. And P.S. Air is not a luxury. It's a necessity. Right. right. <laughs> so now we're going to talk about weightlifting a bit. <laughs> How does weightlifting relate to the emotional labor of women? So... <laughs> Part of what I talk about in the book is my journey into weightlifting. And I never thought I would say these words, but I am a competitive caliber weightlifter. That's amazing. Um, I didn't realize that until I was, you know, reading this book and researching. I, I really didn't realize that's amazing. Thank you. And it still is kind of like astonishing to me to even say it out loud. I grew up as a total bookworm and a total nerd. And so partly because of how my family labeled me and, you know, we get these labels that we absorb. We don't necessarily know how they're even there, but I thought of myself as a non-athlete. And again, because of my daughter, I thought, wait, I want to model um, fitness for her, but not in this way where it's like I'm dragging myself to the gym or it's about, you know, being skinny or whatever. I wanted to do it in this really positive way where I genuinely felt good about it. I got into weightlifting and I had this early lesson in weightlifting that I still think about because I think it relates to women. So I'd been really scared of weightlifting, partly because I had lower back issues oh. yeah. and which many people have. And I always assumed it was because my lower back was weak. So I remember thinking, okay, I have to strengthen my lower back and maybe then I can do a little weightlifting. What I learned is that my lower back was actually in a certain way too strong. Hmm. Like it was doing too much. And that's why it was in pain because the other areas around it were not doing enough. Okay. So of course, you know, it was in pain. And I realized like the lower back is like the mom of the body hmm. where it's spread too thin and doing too much. And the areas around it aren't necessarily stepping up 
And with lower back pain, usually the way to get rid of it is to activate all of those muscle groups that have fallen asleep, like mm. your glutes and your core and your hamstrings. Once those kick in, lower back pain disappears. So for me, this is a metaphor where I think so often for women, it's our partners or spouses or family members and societal structures that are lacking for us. And so we're in this position where of course we're exhausted. We are spread too thin. We're doing too much. But what do we think? We assume that, oh, maybe I should be doing more. Maybe I should be stronger. Like maybe if I download that app or read that article or wake up 20 minutes earlier and do yoga and meditate, like maybe that will help me. And no, the answer isn't to do more. The whole thing is that we're already doing too much. And if we can get the support we need, and I think part of that just involves asserting boundaries mm -hmm. and requiring more of the people around us, um, then that lessens our load so part of what I always say to people is that weightlifting for me isn't about picking up heavy things. So much of it has been about finally setting things down. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And that's interesting, and that's interesting about, about boundaries. boundaries. I, know for myself, I know for myself, I really didn't, I really didn't do that well do for that myself well to myself like to get into my 40s. my 40s. Really, you know, yeah. um, but if we don't set those boundaries, no one else will. No one else will for us. And it's that's part of the self-care and survival of us, I believe, to, to set those boundaries for yourself and with other people, but personally, too. Like, all right, this is what I can do, and it is okay if I don't do more than that today. It's, it's going to be all right. The world's not going to end, and, and we will go on. You know, it's going to be all right. Yeah, that's right. And I also think often the other people in our lives, they don't want to be asleep at the wheel. You know, like your core and your glutes and your hamstrings, they want to be stepping up to the plate and doing their job. But if the lower back is doing everything, they don't have the opportunity to do that. So right. when I have these moments where I get like skittish about asserting a boundary, I always try and tell myself, like, no, I'm giving my brother an opportunity to step up as opposed to, like, me saying no. You know, it's like, no, I'm allowing someone else to do this thing that they might benefit from. Mm -hmm. That's a very good way to look at that. All right, let's see here. All righty. So, Maya. What does it mean for you as a woman to claim your own strengths? These are excellent questions. Um, what does it mean for me to claim my own strength? I think part of it means, you know, as you said, turning 40 really changed something for me where I basically realized I can spend my whole life trying to please other people and giving a lot of thought as to how I come across. Mm -hmm. Or I can toss all of that out the window and give myself permission to think about who I want to be and what I want my daily life to look like as opposed to what it looks like from the outside. So um, yeah, my whole life I sort of grew up with all these messages about what it means to be good and polite and cooperative. And for women, that can be this really exhausting tightrope walk. Yeah. There's a fire alarm going on outside. I hope you guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I think, you know, it's like that whole ridiculous balance of like, how do I seem smart without coming across like a know-it-all? Or how do I seem strong without being aggressive? Or how do I, you know, and it's like, 
We need it's to just, just be. <laughs> we need to just be. That's right. And, you know, men do not most of the time subject themselves to that kind of mental torture. And I don't want my daughter to be in that space of kind of constant self critique and self judgment. Um, so yeah, for me, I think owning my strength has meant as much as possible hopping off the tightrope and just, and I think it gets easier when you're older to not care so much about how you seem to others. Absolutely. <laughs> Um, I'm wondering if our audience has questions. They've I was just going to mention that. Yes. Yeah. So if you have any questions, this is the time. Click on ask a question on your screen and please enter them there. Or feel free to enter them into the chat box. Uh, we'll be happy to go over them. Um, I have one more question for my here. Um, how was writing a memoir different from writing fiction? Oh my God, so different. Um, it's funny, I was just teaching a fiction class earlier today, and this kind of came up. I think fiction feels um, safer in a lot of ways. You know, it's sort of like you invent this parallel universe with imaginary characters, and you give yourself permission to explore issues and character traits and personality conflicts and tensions. And you tell yourself that those people over there have nothing to do with me. And often it's the stuff that we are grappling with that we don't realize we're grappling with until we start writing a short story or writing a novel. And then in the act of writing, there's this moment of like, oh, that's me over there. I just didn't realize it this whole time. Whereas with memoir, you're facing all that stuff very directly and head on. So it's much more vulnerable and much more sort of immediate and raw. So my way of describing it is that I think writing fiction is sort of like listening to the human heart through a stethoscope and writing memoir is like holding the human heart in your own hands during open heart surgery. <laughs> and it's scarier. There's also something so beautiful about the immediacy of it, you know, um, but you don't get to have that kind of distance and remove that you do in fiction. Mm -hmm. I do have another question for you that I like to ask our female authors in particular. Um, at what point did you realize that your voice had strength that could be as a writer or just as a young girl, a young woman, what, what point was that for you? Or that it had well, power, so, really, I should say, your voice had power. Yeah, I mean, I think in some ways that's something I'm learning more and more as I do it. But, you know, basically as a girl, I had always turned to writing as my way of coping and processing everything around me. And it was something that I did in private. And I never thought that I could make a career out of it. And partly, as I said, when I was pregnant and when my daughter was born, I thought, wait, why do I have this like secret closeted part of my life? I should be out trying to do something with this. Um, but it was also that I have always read voraciously. Um, I'm always reading novels and short stories and you know just and often as i was reading i would think well i kind of think i can do better than this or i would read something amazing and think god i want to achieve that feeling and that connection with the reader um and then when i started writing this will sound weird but there's something about when I'm in the act of writing, even though it sounds like it's such a solitary time, you know, you're just with your laptop. For me, it's often late at night. And somehow I can almost feel the reader on the other side who needs to hear something that 
maybe because they're struggling with something that they feel very isolated about, or they feel like it's only, you know, they're the only one who's struggling with that particular thing. And even though I have no idea who that writer is, and I can't actually picture them, I somehow just sort of sense them. And that connection, if I can tap into that, is incredibly enriching and fulfilling. And I think when I feel that, that kind of gives me the strength to step into my story more and believe it more um, and put it out there more. So yeah, in my writing, you know, since writing this memoir, I've been writing essays and I've been sort of putting more and more of myself out there. And I have found that the stuff that's the scariest to say is what resounds and connects with people the most. Sure. Um, so that's been a lovely takeaway. My goodness. Well, I didn't see any questions come in, which means we must have covered everything that they were thinking. <laughs> this is actually a first for me. I know. To not get questions. Usually there's a bunch of questions. So I know. hopefully I know. it's just because you and I have been so riveting. Well, you were for sure. <laughs> I'd like to remind everyone, if you would like to purchase your uh, copy of what we carry from the Doylestown Bookshop, you can click the button on your screen that says buy the book. We have signed book plates and very, very, very interesting, awesome little bookmarks that Maya sent us to send out with the books that we're very grateful for. Um, we'd be happy to send that out to you. We also have curbside pickup. If you live locally, you can pick your book up at the Doylestown or Alaska Bookshop. Um, in lieu of questions, I'd like to thank you, Maya. This was really a wonderful, wonderful conversation and event. This is fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, no, thank you. It was so nice to be in conversation with you, and it felt like we got to really talk about things in a deep way and I got to hear about your daughter um, so that was great and it was nice to have this time with you wonderful well I look forward to seeing you in the fall I can tell everyone who's watching although it hasn't been properly announced we're very excited to have Maya as one of our participating authors for the Bucks County Book Festival uh, which will be the last Saturday in September. So we are very excited. You'll get a chance to come out and meet her then. Look out for more information on that. Good luck with your book, Maya. It's really, I have to, I'm still finishing it, but it was beautiful, a beautiful book. Thank you for writing it. And thank you for being with us tonight. Oh, thank you so much. I really enjoyed this. And um, I will also say to everyone, support local bookstores support Doylestown um, because bookstores do so much to create and foster a sense of community. And we need that now more than ever. So thank you for all that you do to support authors and books because it's so necessary and the world would be a gray and sad place without you. Oh, thanks so much. <laughs> Well, thank you again. Thank you, everyone, for watching, and I'll see you in the fall. I will see you in the fall. All right. Take, Take care. care. Thanks so much.